Good morning, everybody. You're very, very uh, welcome. This is the second session in the series of science dialogue events running within the context of the AU-EU summit taking place this week in Brussels, formally on the Thursday and Friday, 17 and 18. Uh, but already there's a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, people in town, uh, many for the first time in a long time. And this is really a terrific opportunity to, to engage. And of course, what, we're, what we are specifically aiming to do is raise awareness of the contribution of science and collaborative research to the broader Europe-Africa policy agenda. And many of you will know that the last summit, which should summits, this summit should take place every three years, but the last one was in fact five years ago in, in Abidjan. So we've missed the platform, we've missed the opportunity to engage, and we've missed the, certainly missed the, the dialogue, but here we are, let's, let's look forward. So um, you know, specifically, we feel there's enormous scope for engagement with policymakers and policy making. And of course, you know, with the scientific community, you can, you can never do enough explaining and, and, uh, and demonstrating. Um, but having said that, uh, we feel that there's a very uh, important aspect of, of policymaking. And we feel that uh, broadly, when one considers scientific activity, we like to advocate for a, a, a policy basis for, for science and not just a, a programmatic uh, basis. And as we go forward, we are looking at increasingly um, complex policymaking, greater challenges, greater regulation. The first meeting this morning. Sorry, Declan, I realized that you by mistake. No problem. And our first meeting this morning was dealing with uh, the impact of regulation on science and the impact of those regulations really uh, in, in, in Africa. And I think that's one example of how, in one sense, life is becoming more complicated. But of course, in another sense, it is looking at the opportunities within the advancement of uh, an enabling policy and regulatory environment for science. And I think this gives us great cause and pause for for uh, reflection so certainly in the meetings this week it's it's not you know it's it's not necessarily of course it, we're always grateful for, for funding but it's not about you know where's the money it's it's more about you know what is the policy basis for support for science and of course then that in my experience leads to a, a probably a, a more adult discussion uh, around funding uh the policy discussion again. This this uh, this summit will, of course, have a strong focus on on uh, issues such as peace and uh, security, immigration, um, health. Of course, is there. But I think with all those and and other other agenda items, and of course, you will be very familiar with the green agenda and the digital transformation agenda, which Europe is is pushing. And I think with all of these, one has to recognise the important and fundamental role of the, the scientific community and science and collaborative research in achieving these broad political and policy objectives. So that's, that's where we want to aim the, aim the discussions. And I think within that, uh, there, there are, of course, there's many aspects to this, but uh, just one amongst many themes that we will, we will, we will consider uh, this week is a broad agenda item concerning inclusivity. And I think this is, this is uh, to state the obvious, uh, very important, but what that means for science and science collaboration in Africa, science collaboration in Europe and science collaboration between Europe and Africa and between African leadership and European leadership. And I think in that we, we must recognize a, a number of things. But for example, I think the, the global enabling environment is hugely important. And to that, I suppose we can, we can point to the United Nations SDGs, which prevents presents a, a great and very eloquent narrative around challenges society is, is faced with. But of course, within that, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we advance a, 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 a role of science? And you will know that the European Union and to quite a large extent also the African Union 
policy agenda is aligned with the United Nations SDGs. So I think this, again, is just by way of explaining how important the global uh, context is to the broader narrative this week and indeed to this very, very uh, important meeting we, we have this morning. And of course, universities, as I don't have to tell you, are, are hugely fundamental to any scientific activity. And again, how do we advance that at policy maker level? So really, I, that, that's just a, that, that's probably a, a enough for me. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and and, uh, and congratulations to to Laura on working so hard to bring this really excellent excellent group uh, uh, together. And I, I I would encourage you to you know don't see this as a as a meeting. See it as the the beginning of a a process. We want to inform not just the EU Africa Summit, but we want to inform the multilateral system. And you will know the fora where these discussions take place, the United Nations General Assembly, the G7, the G20 process, COP27 will be in Egypt in, in November this year. And increasingly, you look at these, you look at these agendas and they're becoming more alike. And that's because, again, the challenges are becoming quite, quite pervasive and there's, there's there's no hiding and any fora is a very, very important fora to, to advance. And so please you know, think very much in, 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 in future terms, think very much in terms of what you feel policymakers need to, to do and what future policies need to, to look like. And just a brief word is that the, the of course, the, 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 I suppose the key program we'd, we'd really uh, have in mind this week is the is the European Union's NDICI, the Neighbourhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument, also known as Global Europe. And I ju ju just one, and to my to our Africa friends, sorry for the uh, Euro bias, but let, let's just try and, and and make sure there's a very very balanced discussion. And, and the and the objective this week, within again with reference to inclusiveness, is to really support and advance. Uh, in Africa, leadership on science and technology. So having said that, I would like to turn now, and it gives me a great honor, a great honor to introduce Ernest Ayiti, the Secretary General of the African Research Universities Alliance and the former Vice Chancellor of the University of, of Ghana. Ernest, the screen is yours. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Declan. Let me begin by thanking you, Declan, uh, for the invitation to Arua, the African Research Universities Alliance, uh, together with the Guild of uh, European Research Intensive Universities to co-convene this side event uh, as part of the uh, efforts uh, preparation for the AU-EU Summit taking place this week. So we, we are very happy uh, to be doing this together. Um, in, in saying that, I also want to draw attention to the fact that as far back as 2017, uh, the European Union and the African Union agreed on the need to strengthen uh, higher education systems, uh, research and innovation, as a major step uh, towards achieving sustainable development uh, uh, in the region. So um, collaboration between European and African researchers has been since then a, a major feature uh, uh, of this collaboration. Uh, the, the, the key thing there is uh, how, how to design uh, collaboration that takes into account uh, the, the context from which various researchers are coming, uh, takes into account the needs of the different parts of our, our, our world, uh, the different needs of European researchers, the different needs of the African researchers, uh, I'm very happy, indeed many of us are very happy in this collaboration. Uh, a number of initiatives have come from the European side uh, that support these uh, uh, steps that have been mentioned. So a good example is what we've seen as the modifications to uh, Horizon Europe. A good example is what we've seen changes in the Erasmus program. And lately, the Arise program has been the, latest, the, the, the biggest addition uh, focusing directly on Africa, African researchers. Arua and the Guild are extremely happy to be associated with this. And we have organized in the last several months 
a number of engagements uh, to bring African and European researchers together, make them recognize the opportunities so they can take advantage of them. Uh, they, we have had these sessions with African researchers only, also uh, drawing the attention to the opportunity that exists uh, under each of these uh, various schemes. I see what Arua and the Guild have achieved as a shining example of what equitable partnerships can mean. Uh, an example that uh, Declan, you and your colleagues can look up to basically a strong European network working with a strong African network to try and bring researchers together. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it will be a really, really good outcome of this conference uh, if we begin to take advantage of these uh, existing networks and how collaboration in a very uh, equal manner leads to outcomes that we, we are all looking for. So this forum today uh, provides an opportunity to share experiences. Uh, we've designed it uh, to provide a platform for Afri two Africans and two Europeans to share their experiences on how uh, or what types of partnerships would work in research or innovation. So with these, uh, are the presentation that we moderated by Peter Marson. Peter, Peter is a professor from uh, University of Oslo. Uh, he has been working strongly with us in this area. Uh, he's very, very knowledgeable about how African uh, research systems work, having done a lot with colleagues at Stellenbosch and other places. Uh, Peter has been very active in the, our relationship with the Guild, uh, and he's uh, very well placed to moderate uh, this morning's uh, event. So let me now turn to Professor Peter Marsden and invite him to introduce our uh, panelists and the panel. So Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Ernest, uh, for your introduction. Thank you, Declan, for um, inviting Arua and the Guild um, to um, present and organize this panel. And it's now time to go to um, the panelists, to the panel and to the topic of, of this morning's panel, that is universities as gateways between Africa and Europe, promoting a sustainable EU, uh, AU partnership through university collaboration. And as the title of the panel clearly indicates, the university um, is a central institution, a key institution in the um, emerging new uh, strategic partnership between the African Union and the European Union, and is um, expected to play an important role um, in, in many ways. And this morning, we will reflect on the roles that uh, the universities uh, are playing in the uh, African-European uh, partnership, and also how we can move from where we are now um, even though progress has been made in the last four years since the summit of 2017 uh, in uh, promoting, supporting uh, scientific collaboration between Africa and, and Europe, still a lot of work is ahead of us, as also Declan and Ernest uh, referred to. The Guild and Arua has, uh, have um, developed a partnership uh, that over the last four years uh, has um, developed lots of uh, concrete proposals for how African European university collaboration can be strengthened and how in an integrated way, the uh, scientific um, uh, uh, capacity, the infrastructure, uh, the output of African universities can be um, enhanced. So with that as a starting point, uh, and also referring to um, the statement of the president of Senegal last Thursday, but he said that the uh, EU AU summit um, should produce a renewed, modernized, and more action oriented partnership. What kind of actions can we promote um, from the European uh, and the African university side? Where is it that uh, our collaboration uh, is leading us, and what way can we um, uh, develop uh, concrete ideas and proposals to our politicians? Uh, and our university leaders uh, and other stakeholders that can contribute to uh, not just the uh, enhanced capacity for research and innovation at African universities, but, but for the universities in Africa and Europe to really uh, move forward on uh, their role as uh, gateways for 
the new strategic partnership between Africa and Europe. So the momentum has come. It's time to take stock. Where are we? What have we learned? And how can we move forward? And uh, for this, uh, I'm very grateful um, that uh, we've managed to um, uh, get the participation of um, an excellent panel of four members, four scholars, two from Africa and two from Europe. And I will introduce each of these uh, now at the beginning of the panel and then uh, start um, with uh, raising uh, questions to, uh, to each of them individually. And uh, through uh, the questions, we will uh, also be able to identify a number of the key issues that are of importance uh, for the further development of the African uh, European University collaboration and their role as gateways. So let me start with uh, introducing the panel to you. And I want to start with uh, Professor uh, Hugh um, Abriel, uh, Vice Rector uh, for Research from the University of Bern, where he also since 2009 has been a professor of uh, uh, molecular medicine. From 2012 to 2020, uh, Professor Abriel was a member of the Research Council of the Swiss uh, National Science Foundation, where he in the last two years also chaired the biology and medicine division. He has uh, collaborated in many ways uh, with uh, especially French speaking African scholars at uh, universities. Um, and he has just finished an uh, academic sabbatical spent uh, at the universities of Kinshasa and the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, University of Fez in, in Morocco. And uh, Professor um, Abriel will use his experience um, in, and also his understanding of uh, the policy uh, context to address some of the key issues. The next speaker, uh, the next member of our panel is Professor um, Hilde Bras, uh, uh, Professor of Economics and Social History at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, uh, where she's um, as a chair at the Faculty of Arts, uh, and uh, she's attached to the Research Center for Historical Studies, with a special attention in her research on global demography and um, health, global health. Professor Bras is an elected member of the Social Sciences Council in the Netherlands and an alumni of the Young Academy of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. Since 2016, her research has been mostly focused on uh, reproductive and child health in the global south, and she's most notably focused on Sub-Saharan Africa, where her research has focused on gender uh, dynamics and unintended birth, and she's conducted research in various uh, Sub-Saharan African countries, including Tanzania, Ethiopia, in Senegal. The next speaker is uh, Barry uh, Dolatsky from um, the uh, uh, University of Witzwatersrand in South Africa. Uh, he's an emeritus professor in electrical and information engineering and director of the innovation strategy at Wits University. He's the founder and director of the University, um, uh, University of Witzwatersrand's uh, Joburg Center for Software Engineering, and he was appointed in 2021 as the director of the innovation strategy in the office of the WITS deputy vice chancellor for research and innovation. His contributions to the South African IT industry and practice have been widely recognized, while he's also received in 2016 WITS University's vice chancellor's award for academic citizenship. The fourth, the fourth speaker, uh, the fourth member of the panel is um, Dr. Nana Ama Brown-Klutzi, senior lecturer in physics at the University of Ghana, where research is generally focused on climate modeling and climate impacts. She's the lead author in working group one and a member of the task group on data support for the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the six assessment report. She's a member of the scientific board of the international basic science program of UNESCO. And she has worked uh, on national as well as international projects consultancy, including the climate and health project in Ghana and the ongoing global cortex experiment. She's also highly dedicated to social engagement and community services uh, in her country and abroad. So um, these four scholars uh, all have uh, lots of experience uh, in um, collaboration with uh, universities in the other continent, the African um, scholars with universities in Europe and the European scholars with universities in Africa. So I want to start with a question to uh, Professor Hilda Bruss. Um, Hilda, as a professor of economic and social history at the University of Groningen, the Netherlands, uh, you have a focus on global demography and health. In these areas, global demogra demography, global health, 
in these areas, these fields, how can European and yeah. African uh, scientific perspectives complement each other? What is it that we can gain through a more enhanced uh, and more equitable uh, collaboration, African-European uh, collaboration, and how can we do better? And what role can universities play in this? Hilda, uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, let me start by thanking you for inviting me uh, to participate in this panel. Um, just to give you some more background, in my research, I address global demographic and health inequalities, focusing particularly on Sub-Saharan Africa and taking a long-term historical perspective. I study, for instance, inequalities in fertility and childbearing, maternal and child health, and sexual and reproductive health. And currently, I'm starting a project on the colonial legacies of missionary medicine, nursing practices, and reproductive health in East Africa. And this project intentionally foregrounds Africanist perspectives by looking at the tensions underlying relationships between indigenous healthcare and midwifery on the one hand, and biomedical colonial medicine and nursing on the other. It also looks at tensions between patients and nurses and between indigenous and colonial nurses. In such a project, African perspectives are not only complementary, but they are absolutely indispensable. How do African perspectives complement existing knowledge? First of all, by the fact that they add knowledge on lived experience and needs on the ground in the area of study, that is at the local and the community level. Second, uh, by looking at the topic under study through the lens of local languages and indigenous practices, by having access uh, to oral history and different sources, not only colonial archives. And these African perspectives not only lead to much better historical, cultural and socioeconomic contextualization of knowledge, but most importantly, they lead us to new and different questions. So what can we gather through collaboration? In general, I think um, in order to solve large societal issues and global wicked problems like poverty and health inequities, climate change, migration, etc., collaboration brings more diversity of perspectives and ways of seeing. Local and community based insights and experiences, much better uh, contextualization of findings and more effective implementation of, for instance, policy recommendations addressing wicked problems and inequities. But how can we do better? That was your third question. I think that the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the growing call to decolonize have revealed the inequities which have actually increased as a result of COVID that are related uh, to serious structural asymmetries of power and privilege. These permeate all scientific disciplines and also the fields of historical demography and global health uh, in which I am active. So how can we do better? I think uh, the agenda of most research projects is still often set uh, by non-African researchers and institutions. We can first of all do better by having African scholars and institutions determine the aims, the perspectives and the research questions according to what is needed locally. Secondly, we also need to facilitate and enable African leadership in collaborative re research. Moreover, Africans should be the primary audience of the knowledge produced by this research. And third, uh, we can do better by making more efforts to reach out and include African women in research collaborations. So far, uh, the African PhDs that I have supervised uh, were all male. Yeah. And when um, I attend conferences on the historical demography in Africa, African participants uh, are also overwhelmingly male. So that's... Uh, some of me of the answers that I would like to give to your uh, question. Thank you very much for your uh, very important contribution, your very important reflections and uh, answers to, to uh, difficult questions. Uh, the importance of the contextualization of knowledge um, and also the importance of bringing in new and different questions 
uh, highly relevant, and I'm sure we will come back to that, as is your, your reflection on the need to have um, an more equitable agendas. Um, agendas not set by, by non-Africans, but uh, if we talk about strategic equitable partnership, as the European Commission is doing, then that also got to have consequences for the way we collaborate. In, in research and of course the gender um, issue, um, equitable and, and more balanced gender participation is an extremely important topic. So thank you. And I'm sure we will come back to a number of these issues. And in the meantime, I would um, uh, also ask the participants um, uh, of this panel, if you have any questions, please use the chat for that. We will, um, after the first um, round of question to the panel members, I have a chance to to bring in some questions from the audience so please don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat um thank you for um your contribution professor brass now we move to um to barry um and um, barry you're an emeritus professor uh, electrical information engineering at Witwatersrand university and you spent a part of your career in the uk um We've discussed in, in um, many fora and um, also uh, addressed it in some of the documents produced by uh, uh, the Guild and Arua. We, we addressed the, the need to strengthen um, career opportunities for young scholars in Africa, but also to uh, have more balanced uh, mobilities of students and staff, university mobilities. Um, which also relates, of course, to, to the issue of, of brain drain and career paths of young African scholars. So how can we, um, uh, from an African and an uh, European uh, perspective, how can we promote uh, more equitable uh, mobilities um, and also um, promote, uh, at the same time, career opportunities for young scholars in Africa so that the enhanced mobility opportunities don't lead to brain drain? So what are our options and, and what is the way forward in, um, in uh, this perspective and this important aspect of uh, equitable partnership between African and European science communities? Barry. Thank you very much, Peter. Hello, everyone. Um, I think that the key to me, and um, it was pointed out, uh, you said that the first 10 years of my academic career was to leave South Africa and go and work in the UK. And while in the UK, I, I worked in a big uh, European funded project under the Esprit program with a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, European universities and companies. And I think that the, the, the uh, thing that attracted me most to leave then in the 1980s was critical mass. So working in uh, my university in South Africa, I felt very alone. I felt very isolated. Um, um, moving to the UK and being part of a big uh, pan-European uh, consortium, I felt very supported and very involved. And I think the secret to, to deal with the brain drain, and it, it is a very wicked problem because obviously bright young Africans that have the opportunity to um, to work abroad will be attracted. But I think the key to it is to help them in terms of uh, two things, to help them in terms of being part of a bigger whole. So I think the idea of clustering, which I know has come up in the conversations um, around uh, this meeting and others, is to form powerful clusters between European and African universities so that we uh, don't have African scientists who, who sit uh, feeling sort of isolated and, and part of a much smaller whole, but to try and connect them to bigger projects in a bigger whole. So that's the one thing. I think the second thing is resources and um, kind of obviously um, uh, um, uh, universities and research institutions of the global north are much better endowed in terms of, of resources. And one has to factor that in if you build collaboration to not only look at the, at the um, kind of direct cost, but also to look how one can use those collaborations 
to build resources and build um, uh, uh, stronger facilities for African researchers in their home institutions. I think we should also encourage movement. So I think that um, this idea of a brain drain, rather to not think of brain drain, but to think of, think of brain circulation. So to have people who comfortably move between working in Africa and Europe and vice versa, and going backwards and forwards and enriching their careers and enriching their research. And that also needs resources and some uh, careful thinking about how to do that. And I think just the final word that I wanna say in, in my area, which is in um, software engineering, I've um, um, in or, or been in a lot of discussions with um, colleagues from India who, um, and I um, um, talked once about the brain drain from India and people objected to the idea of a brain drain from India to the US and Europe in the um, digital uh, field because they said, it's uh, not a brain drain, it's a brain bridge. So every Indian who goes and works in the US or in um, uh, Europe in the commercial or in the research and academic area is kind of seen as a bridge back to their home institution. And we should really encourage that idea that people don't leave, but they, they, they plant new roots and see themselves as a bridge back to their home institutions. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, um, for your uh, contribution. The, the idea of clusters is, is, of course, a key idea of uh, Arua and uh, the Guild, clusters of, uh, of universities in, in key scientific areas. We, we might come back to that in, uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, resources, extremely important. Uh, also, um, in um, the uh, work done by Arua and the Guild, there have been various documents in which proposals have been made, concrete proposals on um, what kind of resources are needed and what kind of investments are needed, also in order to uh, realize the kind of uh, outcomes that you were uh, pleading, uh, like uh, better facilities, uh, better infrastructure at African universities for African scholars at their own universities. Uh, and also, uh, of course, brain circulation and uh, brain um, uh, bridges uh, are important. But career opportunities for young scholars in Africa should um, um, make it possible to reduce uh, the number of um, uh, especially young uh, PhD holders that leave Africa each year. Data from Stellenbosch University, the center there, suggests that there are, uh, since the beginning of the century, at least 60,000 more uh, doctoral uh, degree holders left Africa than have returned. So that these are serious challenges. Um, and thank you for, uh, for reflecting on that. There was um, a question in, in, the, uh, in the chat about the activities of uh, the AU and the, and the EU. Uh, some have been mentioned in um, the introduction, both by uh, Declan and by Ernest. Um, what is uh, good before we go to the next speaker is to emphasize that there really is a momentum. The European Union and the African Union have negotiated for a couple of years about their new agreement um, that uh, is um, central um, at the summit um, in, um, later this week. What has happened over the last years is that uh, both the African Union and the uh, European Union have agreed that there is a need to uh, strengthen the investments in research and innovation. And from that perspective, uh, for example, the initiatives from the European Union to introduce the ARISE program that uh, Ernest was referring to, um, the uh, decision to have for the first time a non-European um, regional um, uh, earmarking in uh, the framework program, the Africa initiative is also remarkable as are uh, other instruments. So already, um, there is, uh, as also visible in the Erasmus Plus, there is an, a an, an, um, dramatic increase in the earmark funding for African European 
uh, research, innovation, and higher education collaboration. And one of the aims of this panel and also other activities of the Guild in Arua is to contribute to um, uh, ad, uh, advanced thinking of how in practice, so the action orientation of the president of Senegal, how in practice actions can be developed also after the summit that uh, can do justice to um, the, uh, the, both the potential of the African uh, European research uh, collaboration through universities, as well as the way in which these universities connect to society. So having uh, said that, it's my pleasure to um, move to the next uh, speaker, the next uh, member of our panel, uh, Professor uh, Hugues Abriel from um, the University of uh, Bern. Um, you, you are uh, the new uh, Vice Rector for Research at uh, the University of Bern. You also spent academic sabbatical in various African universities. And uh, I would like to, to uh, uh, raise the question to you, how can we attract more European researchers and students to um, uh, stay um, and to uh, stay a considerable amount of time at African universities? And what can be uh, the potential of developing world-class research infrastructures in Africa to encourage African scholars to return to universities in their continent and to attract European and other non-African researchers. Huge, uh, you, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, many thanks Peter for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and also a big thank you to uh, Barry who introduced uh, the, the brain bridge concept. I like that also very much. So attractiveness of African universities, right? I mean, I, I'll tell you why I was attracted by, by uh, these uh, universities and that's my personal experience and I will see, tell you a little bit more in a broader context. So for me, it was obvious I went to Kinshasa seven years ago, and uh, it, I felt, you know, there is a place there with uh, colleagues from all ages where you can share experience, share ideas, and do research. Uh, so that's why I, I spent, uh, well, I decided to do my long sabbatical, uh, academic sabbatical last year uh, in Addis of Kinshasa and uh, um, Fez. So it gave me the opportunity to work uh, with these uh, young scientists and supervisors in medical genetics labs. Uh, they are per se uh, attractive, these university. I think uh, the problem that my colleagues have or students have is that they don't see it, they don't know it. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, what I learned there, you know, spending time teaching, uh, learning and, and thinking with these uh, very smart young colleagues has been extremely rewarding. Well, it's also rewarding to do that with my students here in Switzerland, but there it's completely different because, you know, I, as I mentioned also, uh, the, the, the low resources aspects uh, may make it uh, that a very different perspective. So uh, I'd like to, to recommend my colleagues from, uh, you know, the, the, the West, uh, I'd say, well, go out a bit uh, of your comfort zone. And, you know, instead of, you know, thinking about going, do you doing your sabbatical, your, your research at Stanford or Oxford University, think about going to Africa and you will be really rewarded. So that's, that's the first personal aspect to it. And the second aspect I would, and that has been mentioned also by Hilde, well, there are thousands of global uh, questions that one can only address when we collaborate with our colleagues from, from African universities. And from my field, well, there is the clear aspect of medical genomics. Uh, you may know it that uh, the African genome is the most diverse, you know, the African uh, genomes populations, uh, genomic uh, is the most diverse uh, on earth, uh, much more than in Asia and, and, and here in Europe. But when we look at the studies that have been fair, uh, done on, on the genomic basis of diseases, only uh, 2% of the populations are coming from, from the African populations. So it will be a huge mistake now not to investigate massively, you know, the African genomes populations. And obviously, you know, the first who we're going to benefit of it well are going to be the local populations, but globally, we are all be better understanding the, the genetic background of, of many common and rare diseases. And this is a project also that has been uh, 
mentioned and led by a, 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 a professor of genetics from Cameroon, uh, Ambrose Wonkam, who has, who's just right now proposing to start you know, the sequencing of 3 million uh, of inter-African individuals. Um, so I think, uh, well, those are my two reasons. But coming back to my first statement, well, if you go to the continent, will, you will meet people. You will, will, I mean, I met colleagues, scientists, and one aspect to it, you know, you don't meet the institutions, right? You will work and study with, with colleagues, young, older, uh, and you are not going to, obviously there is an infrastructure at this university, but the real reward is that you are going to work uh, with new colleagues and that's what makes the, these African universities extremely attractive. Then there was the last question about these um, sort of cluster of excellence. And uh, it has been mentioned too, there are, you know, um, um, there is a myriad of global questions regarding health, climate and other aspects. And, uh, I think that the idea to, to start with new infrastructures is obviously a good one. And obviously there is an aspect that one should not miss. There is an opportunity here to, to for once not copy paste from the past, right? I mean, uh, the, the first thing one has to do most likely, and we do that here in the North, we would like to um, revise the concept of world-class or excellence. So, uh, and here, Clearly, one could start to say, well, what is excellence? Here, excellence is more like, you know, the transdisciplinarity, you know, bringing together a bunch of disciplines together. And if you take one, one field that I know better, one health, uh, then you have to, uh, to have ecologists, zoologists, um, uh, uh, medical doctors and veterinarians, sociologists and, and uh, epidemiologists, and IT specialists to work together. And if you can do that, uh, start from scratch these new infrastructure in that way, maybe they will be excellent. And there is a the lot of aspects to it. It's also, you know, how to govern these new uh, types of, of, of clusters and, and institutions. Uh, I think here we have to indeed to look at uh, the fact that it has been very diverse and as inclusive as possible. And by having these values here, the, I, I see that these clusters are going to be excellent and they are going to be, you know, for us and for everyone in the world, cool and attractive. And so I'm really looking forward to see uh, many of these new clusters, uh, you know, starting on the continent. That's uh, the way I see it. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much, Jürg. Uh, um, three important points. Um, the uh, first point relates to the um, change dynamics in, in, in African science. Um, it doesn't get uh, always the attention outside the continent, but there are uh, very important, if not dramatic changes going on in many uh, universities um, and also other uh, research institutes in Africa. Uh, at the same time that uh, um, uh, China and other uh, Asian uh, countries have increased their research output, the uh, part of um, research output that produced in Africa has not only absolutely, but also relatively increased. So there is a lot uh, going on. And as you said, this is uh, an area uh, and, and the continent with many uh, young scholars. There's a lot of uh, very interesting work going on. Uh, so it, it does make sense to open your eyes uh, for the change dynamics and the scientific productivity in Africa. Um, and also the, the global knowledge area. We cannot afford in our further development of the global knowledge area not to include Africa in a more um, serious and a more equal way um, with agendas driven by African scholars. Absolutely, a key point. And one of the ways to do that might be through new instruments, new approaches, new way of thinking. And uh, Arua and the Guild have developed together the notion of um, clusters of excellence within an African context. And we've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback from that, both from um, the universities, but also from the politicians, the European Commission, the African Union, etc. It was um, recently uh, further uh, elaborated and promoted by a statement in a statement made by, uh, by Arua. So thank you, uh, you for, for these points. And now I uh, now want to move on to, to Nana, our fourth panelist, Nana Ahmed Brown-Klutzi from the University of Ghana. 
Uh, Nana, you're a senior lecturer in physics at the University of Ghana. You've been involved in many international uh, as well as national research projects on, on climate change. So how can we strengthen, uh, from your perspective and your experience, how can we strengthen the capacity of African science to bring its uh, uh, perspective on the key um, global uh, challenges, the, the wicked problems, as has been referred to by Hilda, for example. How can we um, strengthen capacity of African science to contribute to our, not just um, uh, our understanding, but also our research and solutions with respect to uh, wicked problems, uh, uh, societal challenges like climate change. So how can we make sure that uh, African scholars, African science becomes more integrated um, and um, also uh, in, in a growing number of areas leading uh, in, uh, in this? Um, what's your perspective on it, uh, Nana? Please go ahead. All right, thank you. Let me thank Arua and the guild for this opportunity. Um, I'll make my contribution right away. So science research contribution from Africa is uh, indeed low compared to um, contributions from other, other continents. Um, strengthening science in Africa, yes, we need to encourage indigenous challenges. I mean, research into indigenous challenges that will probably attract the interests of uh, science scientists. We must understand our challenges to be able to address them and then provide quality education um, along the challenges. I like the African Union Agenda uh, 2063, the Africa we want. <clears throat> that will allow or direct research into how we want Africa to be. When we solve our local challenges, we automatically contribute to solving a global one. Of course, we should uh, be guided by the global goals like the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, Sandai Framework, etc. I give a typical example, poverty in Africa. It is an indigenous challenge which affects many aspects of the society. Science, technology, innovation are key drivers for poverty eradication and essential components for also achieving the sustainable development goals. We cannot simply do without science in the world and especially Africa. I have been involved in this IPCC set assessment report and other global projects as you rightly introduced. There is a clear challenge of the involvement of African scientists and their contributions. I think we have to start with the fundamentals of, um, of training if we have to strengthen the research capacity of African scientists. Mentorship is still important even when one has attained or obtained a PhD. A guide to manuscript writing and publications so you can have all the ideas, but you need to put them into some form of communication to the world. I read a book with the title PhD is not enough. So this is one thing I tell my students to continue to work with their supervisors, advisors, and research team when they finish their PhD. One still needs that science survival skills. Idea searching, Crafting of titles, setting of objectives, planning a manuscript are all skills one needs in addressing the societal and ecological challenges. Again, we need the political buy-ins in science development, policy direction and support. We normally do not get this from governments of African countries. We know that these policy and decision makers know the importance of science and the contribution of science in development. Unfortunately, however, they are not uh, interested in uh, do not, and do not actually fund science research and activities as it has actually to, supposed to be. And uh, lastly, uh, we cannot do this alone as a continent. And that's when collaboration is extremely important. Uh, recently, the UNESCO had signed an agreement on the path breaking agreement to support science, technology, innovation in Africa. 
And I believe that will go uh, a long way in strengthening science development in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nana, for um, um, reminding us uh, of the importance of um, Agenda 2063 and indigenous challenges. The Africa we want, the um, political leaders in Africa in the agenda have amongst others indicated that uh, one of their aims is to have in 2063 at least uh, 200, um, whatever we call it, excellent world-class, but uh, high, highly productive universities that are of relevance um, for, um, for local and continental development, extremely important. Um, so the, the fundamental training that you referred to is also a key point indeed. Um, doctoral training should not be um, um, out of date. It should be linked to the, the changing uh, labor market, uh, whether it's within uh, academia, within uh, science or outside uh, for, for PhD holders and, and uh, also the fact that they're supposed to uh, uh, work more and more interdisciplinary. Also the policy dimension, extremely important. How can we um, contribute to uh, science, innovation, uh, higher education becoming more um, central in the, the policy agendas of, of African uh, countries. And also um, uh, emphasizing the importance of collaboration and the role of UNESCO and others in this. So thank you for this. And um, before now uh, going to, to another round of questions to further elaborate the points that they made uh, to the panel, I, I would like to, to raise one question from, uh, from the audience uh, that was directed uh, first at the um, um, at Hilde, uh, but um, if if other panelists would would like to reflect on it because it, it relates to points that all of you have made, and the question has to do about the persisting uh, inequalities. Um, so how can we uh, influence uh, funding organizations uh, nationally in Africa, as Nana was referring to, uh, but also um, uh, at the continental uh, level and and outside the continent in Europe, uh, both at the European level and national. How can we um, influence uh, funding organizations to, um, to take the persisting inequality seriously and to develop new modes of funding uh, that uh, can uh, do justice to the need for, for more equitable partnerships in science. Um, so please, Hilda, um, if you would like to start and if any of the other panel members would like to reflect on that question, then uh, please, uh, after Hilda start, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Pete. Uh, yeah, of course, I do not have the answer for that. I think uh, what's needed there is a redistribution of power, um, as I already said, uh, to institutions and uh, uh, universities in Africa uh, in order to redress um, these asymmetries and do justice. Um, so I think that, that these are decisions uh, to... Um, hand over uh, redistribute power is something that has to be taken at the governmental uh, or maybe even uh, the international the global uh, level and what is needed is also i want to re-emphasize what the UK already said uh, new structures and processes uh, are actually needed to work uh, in a more equal just uh, way uh, on these issues We don't hear you, Peter. You have been mute. Sorry, um, sorry, yes. After two years of the pandemic, I still every now and then forget to unmute. Um, thank you. Any of the other panel members? I see Nana and also see uh, Declan would like to, um, to come in uh, to the discussion. But first, Nana, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, I want to answer, react to the question of how do we attract funding? Um, so, I start basically with communication of ideas. So I think scientists also need uh, to have some kind of training or some kind of um, ways to be able to communicate their ideas, especially to government. I once asked uh, the principal investigator of Newton Fund, uh, funded by the UK government. I asked him, how were you able to convince your government to fund astronomy training and capacity building in Africa. Because for us in Africa, when you mention astronomy, yes, they, they think of something completely out of uh, reality. 
So yeah. how are you able to convince your government that astronomy training is important and even in Africa? And then it's like, yes, of course, you need to have that uh, uh, to explain, yes, uh, have your proposals to be catchy and how each and every uh, outcome, output of the project can uh, support or help that government. And in Africa, it's like you have to, the project must, to win a project funding, uh, that output should be uh, support or how the government can win the next election. It's, I mean, typically I put it back this way, how the, the uh, how would the project output help the government to win the next election? And our political season, it's about four years and maximum eight years. And we know science research can take a, long, a bit of a longer time to get output. So now we need to design uh, science research around short-term outputs. Once you have that, then you are able to get um, a, a funding. So it boils down to communication, first of all, on the importance of that particular research going to the impact it will have on the society, people going to be happy with the government when that funding is given, and then also um, um, more of um, and and then more of how the government in 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 of the day will be able to attract more support going forward in terms of winning the next um, election or something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nana. Uh, Declan, you wanted to uh, come in? Yeah, just uh, very very interesting. Just just two. Um, point I'd like to raise from, from uh, my experience. And just the first one, maybe picking up from her, uh, uh, picking up on Nana's point, uh, is really, yes, no, everything Nana said, is, I'd absolutely subscribe to. But in addition, I, I think it, it's probably, and I, I say this for myself many times, it, it's probably no longer sufficient to engage with, in this case, maybe policymakers. I, I think you actually have to go and you know, find ways to, 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 to write the policies. I think it has to be very, right, if I was a, which I'm not, and I have no interest, but if I was an oil company from, you know, wherever, and I wanted the legislation and regulation of a particular country to, to support me, I would be lobbying very aggressively and I would be doing very proactive activities to do that. So I, I, I just feel that the, Certainly, broadly, the, the education science community needs to do the same, uh, have the same approach, in my view. Um, I'm not saying it's easy, but I, I really feel that's where one has to move because broadly, access to funding for whatever is anyway becoming more competitive. So it's not sufficient to, to keep doing the same thing. And then also there's a there's an analogy I like to use. So I'm sitting in Brussels today, and kind of when I look out my window, there's a, there's two lines of people. You see, there's a very 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 long line, and they're queued up at the the window that says you know uh, uh, money here. You see, and lots of people there, and, and of course you know you know I'm going to be the last guy in the line. You know, but then around the corner there's a there's another window, and it says ideas here. You see, it's a very short line. So again, just, just maybe paraphrasing uh, what Nana was saying, it, it, it's, it's more important to sell ideas than it is to sell uh, um, requests for money. Now that is a simplification, of course it is. However, I think the need for a very comprehensive engagement with policymakers is, 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 is vitally important. And that's changing, it's becoming, I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, but it is becoming far more complex and needs new approaches and solutions. The second point I'd like to say directly on the point of funding is something we've been working on is to, is to build, uh, rather, we, we, we've, we've, we've noticed a lot of uh, activity around uh, uh, development finance. And development finance, you will know uh, in the guise of the World Bank, the IMF, the African Development Bank. So there's, you know, there's about, I think it's about 400 development banks around the world. Now, by and large, you know, the, the business model for 
development banks historically has been, you know, a well in Namibia or a roundabout in Sudan or whatever, you see, classic, you know, infrastructure sort of stuff. But if you look at the annual general meeting of the World Bank and the IMF last November, and the, these two institutions, by the way, and others are UN bodies. So if you look at what they're doing, they're starting, starting in my view, to appreciate that actually this, this, uh, this science stuff, this education stuff is actually important for addressing their policy and political agenda, which is effectively for the sake of this conversation, the SDGs. So I, I think that's a forum and, and, and um, um, Hilda had mentioned the, uh, the, the, the global dimension. So I really feel that this needs to be considered. And when you're talking about funding, there's, a, there's essentially I think uh, three strands. You've got the you've got the the, the 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 public funding, the taxpayer stuff. You've got the private venture sort of stuff, and you've got this development finance. And I think there needs to be a much more comprehensive engagement with these with these three three uh, three avenues. So, Peter, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. Um, uh, in uh, Arua and the Guild. Uh, we did uh, try over the last four years to to influence policy. We've um, used uh, both the secretariats of the guild and uh, Arua to to try to develop ideas, uh, proposals um, that that would make sense. And one of the ideas has contributed. And uh, fortunately, it wasn't only us. There were many who, over the last years, have uh, contributed to the development of uh, policies. But one of the uh, ideas that we had was. Um, uh, related to what later has become the ARISE program. So how can we, um, in um, the, the, um, uh, the African European context, how can we contribute to better, uh, more sustainable, attractive career paths for young scholars in Africa? And the ARISE program is, is a pilot which is currently implemented uh, with the selection process for, for the young scholars in Africa that are gonna get um, one of the grants. But it is typically an, an, uh, an uh, example of a uh, successful, a potentially successful funding innovation that could lead to the equivalent of an African Research Council, which is uh, coordinated uh, and uh, controlled by African scholars, uh, in this case, the African Science Academy, uh, and which could uh, significantly contribute to uh, more equitable uh, funding approaches and uh, building of capacity in Africa as one example. We could go into more examples um, uh, like uh, the development in the Erasmus Plus, where um, in all the regions uh, that um, Erasmus Plus is, uh, is earmarking uh, uh, funding for, Sub-Saharan Africa was the region in the previous Erasmus Plus with the lowest budget uh, earmarked for, for collaboration, while in the new Erasmus Plus, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the uh, region with the largest budget of the 2.1 million, that is a billion that's earmarked for collaboration, 600 million uh, euros uh, earmarked for African uh, European collaboration um, in higher education. So th there are opportunities, things have changed. It isn't only um, inequitable and unequal anymore, but there's still a lot of work to be done. But one of the challenges is for scholars in Africa and Europe to use the opportunities that are emerging and that are there. And from that perspective, I would like to raise the next question to you. Um, and that is about, from your perspective, uh, in addition to funding, what are the key challenges for developing more equitable uh, scientific African-European university and more broadly science and innovation relationships? Well, thanks, Peter. Well, I see here for your questions, at least, well, from my perspective, two challenges. Uh, I think there is a lack of, you know, just knowledge how to do it right. And I'll come back to that. Uh, and second, um, in our universities, I think there is still too little incentive um, to have fair and equitable collaboration. So we, I mean, we have many of our colleagues, you know, they have done uh, so what we call helicopter science. And that's clearly not the way one should do science on the continent or anywhere, right? So coming back to knowledge and, and educations and how to do it right. I mean, 
uh, I think there is already helps and rules and principles, and, and maybe some of you may know about the so-called 11 principles for fair collaborations. And if you go to the website 11principles.org, uh, you will find these principles in English, French, and German. And by the way, these principles and guidelines were produced by colleagues here at the University of Bern a few years ago, and they are now used by many organizations. So, and if you look at these principles, you know, they go systematically uh, through uh, basic questions such as co-designing the projects, uh, sharing the data, acknowledging the, you know, the, the, the specific contributions, implementing the research results uh, in an efficient and fair way. So uh, I think here we should still work a lot more on, on, on telling our colleagues how to do it right. Uh, and I think if you don't do it, this is, this is clearly a, a, a challenge. Uh, and again, I, I, I would like to come back to something I said before. So uh, in order to, you know, also to improve the current situations, uh, these institutions of our institution per se, we can speak about policies and institutions, but uh, I mean, we are talking about systems that are, have huge inertia, right? I mean, it's very difficult to, to move them. And I think we really have to pay attention that in all these movement and project of change, I mean, those are the people that are going to change things. And we have to have a very participative approach. Uh, we have to involve our young, well, colleagues from here and from, from, from the continent, maybe very young colleagues. They are the ones that have, you know, the energy, the willingness and the time sometimes to, to work on these changes. So that's, that's my statement here uh, in order to, I would say from my personal point of view to change things. Yes, thank you, you, and, and and thank you for um, for um, introducing the notion of, of incentives. Uh, what kind of incentives would be of relevance both within the universities uh, in Europe and, and Africa, as well as um, uh, also um, uh, in, in university systems, and also the notion of knowledge. So, what do we know about? the way in which development, scientific uh, collaborations, um, networks, et cetera, have, have, have worked um, uh, in between Europe and Africa. What are the, the outcomes? Um, what are the kind of uh, factors that influence the, the science dynamics in Africa? Uh, and how can we strengthen our knowledge base, our understanding of uh, change dynamics? Very important. Thank you. Um, Nana, uh, from an, an African uh, uh, perspective, uh, especially an intra-African perspective, uh, while the, the overall um, uh, research output of African, especially university, but African scholars, scholars um, that are working in Africa has increased both absolutely and relatively. Uh, one area still is seriously lagging behind that intra-African research collaboration. So what can be done to uh, promote um, the uh, intra-African research collaboration that can uh, also then um, address the, the, the wicked problems, uh, the indigenous challenges that you were referring to. Please, Nana, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, um, first of all, we need to encourage uh, quality research in Africa. Once you demonstrate quality as a scientist, through your research output, you attract other scientists and other institutions for collaboration. We should insist on quality outputs. I have had a question from a young career scientist on how can one start collaboration? So I feel that was a, a, a legitimate question. My answer was this, that start with your supervisors and colleagues, and more importantly, distinguish yourself in, in your research and then provide a quality output out there. Intra-African research collaboration is uh, important to reduce duplication of, of efforts. I am fortunate to be a part of the committee that worked on the African space policy and strategy of the African Union. We made it a policy to reduce duplication of efforts, noting from the scarce resources that uh, we normally get allocated to science and technology in, in the continent. So the plan was to have different 
space agencies, uh, emerging space institutions, focusing on particular aspects of space science and technology and another space uh, agency in the country will also focus on another. And then we share expertise and we share resources. So I feel that is key for Africa. Once we, we decide on sharing of expertise and sharing of resources, uh, it will automatically bring us into the collaborations we need uh, intra uh, African university collaborations. So we need to um, encourage uh, this uh, to reduce duplication of efforts uh, because we, we, we may want to keep repeating same things. We have very similar challenges in, in, in different countries in Africa. So once we have a solution for a thing in let's say a particular country, that solution may be applicable in a similar country or another country in Africa. So we should not duplicate effort to reduce uh, resources or funding that we spend in trying to address our challenges. And of course, we need to have database, we need to be doing the talking of ourselves, and then we need to publish our research, then we'll be able to have, um, we need to be proactive in also getting in touch with um, the, the right, um, let's say, uh, field of scientists to be able to start talking and collaborating with, with them. So this is an important thing to do. So for, to promote the intra-African university collaboration, I feel African countries and scientists should be proactive in getting in touch with each other. And also, as I said earlier, on produce quality uh, research. Thank you. Nana, thank you. If I may just follow up uh, to, to you uh, on this, because uh, we've seen on the one hand in Africa, the, the first um, uh, university uh, alliance, Arua, uh, Research University Alliance, with an effort uh, to, to develop um, inter-university collaboration, uh, centers of excellence, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we also see um, careful efforts to, to create something like an African Research okay. Council. So, so what is the importance of both uh, the networking between universities in this and what can be expected of it and what kind of programs at the continental level would be needed to promote the uh, inter-African, the um, inter-country collaboration um, that, that you are referring to? Yeah, very well. I think, yeah, that's that's right. Right. I think the African no, research uh, alliance. Uh, but, 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 yeah, Sorry for that. You. Please go ahead. It's okay. Yeah, the African Research Universities Alliance is uh, one of the uh, proactive initiatives that we actually need in the in the continent. So that um, I've once attended, not not once. I think a um, couple of times I've attended programs of the Arua. Uh, one of it was to uh, have a, it was a workshop for lecturers wanting to know some of the challenges and how teaching and lecturing is done. And so we shared a lot of uh, ideas in that uh, forum. So this is an initiative which will help with the intra-African collaboration. So I, it's, uh, it's something I feel we should encourage. It's also a platform for scientists, university lecturers, researchers to share the challenges that are in their various countries, uh, the topical issues that probably need attention. And once that platform is created or is there, other scientists from different countries will be able to share in it and then uh, contribute their expertise uh, that they have. So I feel that's a very a good platform to, to, should I say, to start with or to work with for the continent. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Um, also, um, when I'm looking at the clock, we have 15 minutes. I want to give the floor to, uh, to Hilda um, and ask her um, about the, um, the, uh, the, the kind of ways forward that she sees in creating more um, genuinely equitable partnerships between Africa and, and Europe, between African and European universities. Um, what are the kind of innovations that you feel are needed given also your experience in, in your uh, field 
uh, that could help um, the, um, uh, the both continents to move to, to more equitable partnerships. Hilda. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, to be able to engage in equitable research partnerships, I think African universities and research institutions uh, have to be strengthened first. This means that African governments, possibly also with the help of European funding, must commit not only to uh, short-term research projects, but more longer-term structural funding um, in university education and institutions. And this will enhance both the quantity and the quality uh, of research outputs and also the position of African research in global academia. And this can lead to more equal research partnerships. And secondly, I think that there should be more, and I already told about uh, talked about that decentralization in that research collaborations should be more often situated also in Africa itself and not in Europe and not micromanaged from Europe or other places in the world. And it also means uh, that research funds are managed in African institutions, uh, which is uh, yeah, means a transfer of decision-making power in how funds are spent uh, on, the, on the ground in local uh, in universities. Uh, and with regard to these historical imbalances, I think that different strategies are needed here. So I think, uh, yeah, at um, both at the individual level and at the organizational level, um, at the individual level, we will, of course, all of us have to emancipate and decolonize uh, our minds. Um, and yeah, as European research is and use our privilege to responsibly also empower others. Uh, as research, we may also foreground these imbalances and actually study them. Uh, and I think at the organizational level, we'll have to practice real diversity and inclusion and not like ticking a box uh, in a very tokenistic way, but we we'll probably need uh, new governance structures and processes that reflect a commitment to real change. So decolonized and decentralized approaches that move beyond diversity and inclusion into real and accountable commitment to transformative change. And the last thing uh, was what Nana talked about, that we probably need more South-South or intra-African uh, research networks, which will build not only a stronger, but also a more sustainable African knowledge society. Yes, thank you very much for raising these important points. Um, I, uh, I want to ask the, the participants if they have any questions, please put them in, in the chat so that we can uh, share them with the uh, panel members. Um, um, I want to go to, um, to Barry and um, address a question that um, overlaps with a question in the chat. And that has to do with, uh, with innovation. The, the Commission, the African Union and the European Commission focus a lot on, on, on an innovation strategy. Um, and it seems that also in the funding um, uh, programs, there is a, um, a shift already from uh, funding research to funding innovation. How do you see that, uh, uh, Barry, from your perspective? Uh, what's the role of African universities in innovation and what kind of investments would be needed? Um, aren't we in, in it's almost a rhetorical question, sorry for that, but aren't we in a situation that um, the, the innovation approach, the research approach, the higher education approach are, are too uh, uh, isolated from one another? Um, how can we develop a more integrated approach to the larger knowledge uh, agenda without uh, putting either uh, research or innovation uh, central? Barry, please go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. So it's a huge question and I'll try to answer it briefly. But um, to me, there's um, two steps in innovation. There's research, which is invention, and there's, there's applying that research to solve societal or other problems, and that's innovation. So not until the research is applied uh, does it become innovation. And I think that, that we've got a problem in terms of how we measure what we do. And I think that measurement, and um, um, somebody here said, uh, the research output of Africa is up or down. And when we talk about that, what are we measuring and what are we talking about? 
we're probably talking about publications and PhDs and those sorts of things. So until we measure innovation and we incentivize innovation, we incentivize the translation of research to impact, we won't get good innovation. So I believe we, we aren't seeing innovation to the level we should see it. We're seeing fantastic research going on in some of our universities, but very little of it is being used to solve problems. And then finally, where do those problems come from? And I'm sure everybody knows that we're sitting here in Africa on a continent, continent that by 2050, the population of this continent will have doubled. This isn't a guess or a wishful think, but it's happened because the people that will give birth to the next uh, generation are born already. So we're going to see huge population growth in Africa. And with that comes either problems or becomes huge opportunities. This population of young, bright, uh, many, many Africans who will be born into this world with the so-called fourth industrial revolution and um, digital transformation happening are, are um, sort of raw material for doing amazing innovation. And I think that, um, uh, that um, researchers in Europe uh, shouldn't be thinking of it as um, kind of um, kindness to come and help Africa do research. But if Europeans want to do great research and innovation, Africa is the place to do it. And collaborating with Africans will really help their research and help the world. So I really think we have to take innovation very seriously, measure it and resource it properly. Thank you very much, um, Barry, um, for, um, for this important point. Um, and, and the fact that uh, there should be an interest in Europe in the innovativeness uh, of, uh, of Africa. Um, also, uh, when we think about university university collaboration. Uh, we're approaching the end of our panel. And before giving the floor to uh, Professor uh, Arietti for the final uh, reflection, I want to give the, the panel members um, uh, the chance to um, uh, indicate what, from their perspective, their experience, uh, would be a message to give to the European Union, the African Union, uh, at their um, uh, summit meeting um, uh, later this week. From our university uh, interest, from our perspective, what is it that um, uh, are important messages to give to the to the politicians meet, uh, meeting later this week? Can I start with Nana? Thank you. Um, oh, I think simply. Who is our Levin also here? Uh, Please go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I think simply uh, we all have a, a global goal to, to achieve and um, no, no country or no continent should be left out in any of uh, what the world plans to do. So a typical example is the issue of climate change. And in the last COP26, we had agreed in Glasgow that we are going to do it together. Um, Africa has its typical challenges. Of course, all the, every other continent has their own, um, their own challenges. But then for, for Africa, we want to um, contribute to the mitigation aspects, if you much more than we actually contribute onto the, the greenhouse um, gases. So we're trying to do that means we're going to deny ourselves from assessing our natural resources. Uh, we want to do this. We are poised to do this, but we can't do it alone. So we call on the, the European Union, the parliamentarians, the government leaders, to political leaders in general, to support us in various ways for our development so that, of course, we go by our agreement that we have signed off on the Paris Agreement. I put it simple. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana. Uh, you, uh, may I give you the, the, the word? Well, yes. So um, 
you know, I'd like to, 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 to come back to one core uh, aspect of universities in general. I mean, whether they are on the continent of Africa or in Europe. So uh, there is this notion of academic freedom and, you know, uh, education and basic research. And, you know, upstream of, of innovation, which is really needed. And I, I loved what Barry just told us about what can, can be done in, in, in Africa in terms of innovation. You need also uh, these basic research freedom. And that's what also I learned with my colleagues. You know, not all my colleagues in Africa are interested in applying their, you know, their, their research findings. They are just like me and like us interested about how to, you know, to understand how the world is working. So uh, give them the possibility, fund them, uh, you know, tell the government of, of African countries, fund universities and let them, though these young people do research, maybe project-based, program-based, I don't know, but they, they really a, a big, big need to, to, to really to support these young scientists in African universities. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, Barry, um, please, what is it that you would like to um, send as a message to uh, the politicians? So I think if this uh, terrible experience of the COVID pandemic has taught us anything, it's that the world is, is one. It, 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 there is one world. And I think we have to work together. There's no such thing as African researchers and European researchers. We all are researchers. We all tackle these very big global problems. And I think that we need to be resourced. We need to work together and have opportunities to solve these problems together. So it's to, to kind of look at the system as one and not as two or three or four different systems. Thank you. And finally, Hilda. Yeah, I would like to uh, follow up on Barry. I think also I like this global holistic way of approaching um, yeah, global wicked problems. And to do that, we will need all the perspectives uh, that are available. And I would also like to stress, uh, Barry also mentioned about the demographic changes that uh, by mid-century, a quarter of all people in the world will be living in Africa. So. Uh, that's another argument uh, to uh, incorporate visions and ideas uh, of all. Thank you very much, Hilde. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, you. Thank you, Nana, for your very important and relevant contributions to the panel. Uh, we are at an um, important moment in time. Um, there is a momentum for a new, a more equitable a more action-oriented African-European collaboration, the large agreement that's going to hopefully be signed later this week. And uh, our panelists reminded us of uh, the, the importance of key aspects of uh, the knowledge dimension in the relationship, um, the importance of context, uh, the importance of recognizing um, the dynamics um, of, uh, of Africa, both in innovation and in research, young scholars, uh, and the attractiveness of uh, collaborating with, with African scholars. Um, also the importance of uh, training, of um, bringing training up to the level where it's needed and not just uh, stick uh, with uh, old um, fashioned or traditional um, approaches to training. Funding has been mentioned as well as other uh, aspects where really attention is needed. So all in all, um, the input from the panel also showed uh, that we're at the beginning there is a momentum, there, there's change, there's an opportunity to move forward in the enhancement of uh, collaboration between European and African universities, but there's a lot of work to be done. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing later this week what the role of innovation and research will be in the new agreement between Africa and Europe. Uh, and with that, I uh, thank the panelists uh, again very much for their contribution, their time, uh, their engagement, and I give the floor to, uh, to Ernest for the final reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much for the, the good summary that uh, you've just given us. And I also thank our panelists uh, for sharing with us their various uh, rich experiences. You know, I came into this uh, event uh, with one message that I hope to share, 
basically that the universities are changing. They are changing uh, for the better. They are getting stronger. Indeed, the creation of Arua is a strong statement from African universities that uh, there's a new world in which collaboration is going to be key. So the point that you made, Peter, about intra-African collaboration is uh, what the presence of Arua is said uh, intended to emphasize. But I've learned from our four speakers a lot that will go to enrich the original message that I have. And in particular, uh, a point that Barry made towards the end where he said that Africa is the place to do research. You know, that, that, that statement that Barry made resonates quite well uh, with me and it reflects also what uh, Nana said, what Hilda said, what Hugh said. Uh, Africa is the place today to do research. And it's not only in the interest of the Africans, but also of the world. Today, most problems, the wicked problems that we refer to are global. All the issues that we are contending with are transnational in nature. And so when we do research in Africa, we are finding solutions to problems that would later on surface in Europe, would later on surface in North America or in Asia. So when Hugh spoke about Africa having the largest genome diversity, it, it resonated very, very well with me. I see many young Africans doing research on genome sequencing. And I want us to support them. I want us to be able to let them do lots and lots of this and move to the next step. When you think your genome sequencing, what else do you do? You know, how do you contextualize the research that you are doing? How do you move from the research to the innovation as Barry describes it? I'm very, very pleased with what we've done today. Uh, we've made the point that African universities are changing and opening themselves ready for the world, ready for European research collaboration. And I'm also happy that we've made the point that Africa is the place to do research today. I do hope that uh, everyone is listening. I do hope that uh, our colleagues in the African Union and the European Union are listening and paying attention to what can we do collectively to make research in Africa globally competitive? What can we do to ensure that the research done in Africa leads to innovation that saves our world? So I thank you all very much for making this possible. I thank you for sharing your views. And I do hope that Declan, you, you found the, the information, uh, you found the support that you can bring to the European Union and to the African Union as we move forward. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you.